My name is Ben Settle, and I am happy to say I am one of producer Jonathan Rivera's results leaders. You're listening to ResultsLeader.fm. Being a thought leader is easy. Getting results is hard. This show is for the results leader who lives and dies by their results. Here is your host and chief results leader, Jonathan Rivera. Yes, yes, y'all. It is another edition of ResultsLeader.fm. And I am stoked today because I got this guy. I, I, I had a I had a bag, plea, borrow, steal. I had to give this guy money to get him on the show, but it was it's, it's going to be totally worth it, 100% worth it, because I have not learned more about marketing, about positioning, about branding, and most importantly, about email from anybody else in the world than the notorious and mysterious Mr. Ben Settle, bensettle.com. What is up, my man? Well, that, that was certainly a... Uh... Nice fluff piece about me. I appreciate that, producer Jonathan. I really do. As always. As always. The thing is, man, I, I don't know anybody else that I could point to. And maybe it's just my... Actually, this is, this is my fault. But there was nobody else before I met you that got me the results that you did. And that's why I wanted to have you on the show because there's very few people. I pick up anything you write and it's like three sentences in, I can get some sort of result. And, and I don't know how you do it. And I wish I could do that too, but I have no clue how you do it, brother. So I'm, I'm glad that you're here, bro. Well, I, I appreciate you having me, man. It's always good to, to revisit you, you know, <laughs> how I, I miss our old podcast days. Uh, so it's all good. <laughs> cool. So let's jump into this, man. I have questions for you. I don't want to. I don't want to waste any more time. Let's start with the easy one. What book or books have you given most as a gift? Well, I'll tell you what. Um, I can. I can name three that I've gifted to my newsletter subscribers. Okay. One is the System Club Letters by Ken McCarthy, which I I really do think is the best. Like for me, at least has been the overall best business related book I've ever read. I've read it, I don't know, probably 50, 60 times. It's not a really long book. And, you know, I, it's just, it's just endless. I've also, there's a guy named Vance Morris. I don't know if you know Vance or not, but no. uh, he's, he's pretty amazing. He used, he spent 10 years as a manager at Chef Mickey's at Disney World and is really immersed in the whole Disney way of doing service. And now he teaches that and he uses it for his carpet cleaning business. So it's not, he just teaches it. He's not like one of those thought leaders, right? That just basically they come up with an idea and suddenly they think they, they, but they've never done anything. So he's, he has like two books and they're both really short. And so, you know, it's cheap for me to buy them in bulk and give them away. And uh, his stuff's phenomenal. The first one's called, you think I would know the, you'd think I would actually know that <laughs> one of them's called, one of them's called, I think it's called Disney magic or, or systematic magic. That's the first one. And the second one's called tales from the customer service crypt and both highly recommend you can get them on Amazon are very, very good. Nice. All right. Now let's talk about failure, bro. How has an apparent failure set you up for later success? Well, I'll tell you what, dude, this is going back to 2010. So I, I done pretty good with copywriting and all that back then. <clears throat> this is probably around the time that actually that you found me that I think about it. And I was just getting really sick of client work, uh, doing freelance copywriting work. I was really burned out on it. I got tired of dealing with clients and just the whole game. Just really just, I'd rather just be my own client and I just don't want to work for anybody. So by the end, of, at the very end, even though I had a really good client on retainer that was paying me like five grand a month, plus 1% of the gross sales of their company, which doesn't sound like a lot, but actually it did, you know, I was getting some five figure checks. <laughs> you know, nice. I was pretty happy. And um, even though I, I was happy in that, I just wasn't, happy being a freelancer for anyone still having to get my ideas filtered through and all that. So the very last week, very last week of December, 2010, I sat down, I wrote a business plan out. I said, okay, by the end of 2011, I want to be client free. I want to be just my own client selling my own stuff. And so I had this, this ebook 
which I believe you read about how to deal with prostate problems. Yeah. In fact, you even helped me with some videos and stuff on that. And I was like, so, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I, I, there's this guy that I was, I actually ended up getting into business with in the weight loss niche. He was, he told me how, when he got in his business, he was making $70,000 a year, which is not, you know, it's not a fortune, but basically he didn't do anything all day. He just, got up and played with his kids all day because he set his business up in a way using articles, article marketing. And so he put up like a thousand articles on various easing sites. I'm not going to talk about what he digs. It's it, none of it works anymore. <laughs> so it's kind of pointless to even like go into it. But I thought, wow. And he had no back end, no affiliates, no nothing. He didn't, he, it was just this one offer that he sold. He got leads every day from these article sites and they'd opt into his site and then he'd send it like five emails a week or something, you know, try to do one a day. He'd make five, about five sales of a $20 ebook a day. And he was happy. And he told me how he did it. And I said, God, what if he like, you know, what, I could do that and I actually know how to do business and I know how to write copy and I know how to write emails. I mean, I'd have a back end and all that. So I said, I'm going to apply that what he taught me to the prostate niche. And so I did. And I spent the next month and a half, January and half of February, just hauling, hauling ass, dude, <laughs> like writing. I, I was writing like 20 articles a day. And this is in addition to my regular workload. I was, I was on retainer and I was writing their sales letters and video scripts and all that. I was doing my bensettle.com stuff. I was selling a print newsletter called the crypto marketing newsletter at the time. This is before email players. And, uh, you know, I had, I, it was like one of those things where I maybe slept three hours a night, if that, and I was just in like this haze <laughs> you know, I, wow. like it's still kind of a blur and all that, but I was like, I'm going to do this. And I ended up in that month and a half. I think I, I, don't know, I put up, I don't know, at least eight, six or seven or 800 articles on these various sites. I had put up 400 unique blog posts on a blog. I had written a hundred and some, or maybe it was like 95 email sequence. Just a lot of writing, dude, like the more writing than I've ever done in my life and have ever done since in such a short period of time is probably the equivalent of like three novels or something. Yeah. I don't know what the word count was. It was a lot. And then I went on vacation for a week, went to go visit my dad and I started seeing sales come in for my little prostate ebook. And I started getting like two or three a day. I'm like, Hey, this is starting to work. You know, all this article stuff that I did with the SEO it's starting to work. Literally halfway through that vacation, Jonathan, bam, Google decides to slap article directories. <laughs> Ouch. All that work was for nothing. All my high ranked article, everything went, everything dried up in literally a nanosecond. So that's a pretty big failure, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, hmm, what do you do now? So, but because of that, that was February. I had the rest of the year, you know, as, as a goal to get, I, I didn't give up or anything. I'm okay, well, I got to do something else. And I thought of doing coaching and some other stuff. But I had this, I had been selling this course for a couple, almost two years at the time about email, about email marketing. It was like an $800 course. I was constantly updating. And I don't know, for some reason, my brain, my tired, rattled brain just said, you know, you're always updating this stupid course and people really like buying it. And there's definitely a demand for it. And you're getting bored of writing this crypto marketing newsletter, which is just generalized marketing advice that I sold at like $27 a month. And, you know, I could never get it above like 120 subscribers or whatever. And it wasn't really paying all that much. And I didn't really have much of a strategy with it. And I wasn't even really that into it at that point. And my brain just put these things together. And I was driving up the coast one day, maybe a two or three months later. And it said, you know, instead of updating that damn course, why don't you just do a newsletter about email and have it be ongoing and then take that course and make that the like bribe to subscribe. And I got to tell you, dude, I, I don't think email players, I don't think any of this would have happened had I not had that, that huge failure. And, and to make it even better, all that writing, Jonathan, all that did, I mean, writing, 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 all those pages of writing. After that, writing a single email per day became like the easiest thing in the world. Like writing is not hard for me. I can write. I've written eight novels now. I'm going to start a new novel. Like it's going to be a real long one, probably like five or 5,000 or so pages, probably before it's done. Like writing excites me. It's not hard. It doesn't scare me. It's the easiest thing in the world. So, but it all stemmed from that, from that failure. So I hope that was a, wasn't too long, but I don't know how to tell that in any shorter way. What was the name of the course? I think I bought that course. Um, it was called Street Smart Email, Email. Secrets. And the, th and the thing is, a lot. it's funny because I see it pirated sometimes. 
Like there's still these idiots that pirate and they don't realize that probably 60% of that information is not only doesn't work, but is actually work against you. So it's like, you know, you know, I had to, when I did, when I, when I broke it all out and created its own bribe, I, I had to take all that out. Right. And so it's kind of, it kind of amuses me to think that pirates who actually would go through something like that are actually probably seeing their sales hurt. Probably say, oh, Ben's stuff doesn't work. And they're right. That shit probably doesn't work anymore. A lot of that was tactical. And, you know, that's something, you know, there'd be some SEO type stuff in there and all that. It just doesn't doesn't matter anymore. So anyway. Yeah. yeah. And that is actually how you got me to subscribe to email players was when you had that in there. So that that and that's when I thought ninety seven dollars a month was a lot of money. And I was like, oh my God, what am I getting into? But uh, yeah, a lot <laughs> I'm of actually going to raise, I'm finally going to raise the price on that. No way. Actually. Are you really? Yeah. Yeah. Because everybody now is a $97 a month continuity and it's, it, they, they, they don't realize that all that does is water it down and it just makes everyone look like copycats of each other. And it's like, I want to have something different. So yeah, I'm changing the price on that. Let me guess. Next 101. <laughs> I was thinking of 101, actually. Um, <laughs> I live on Highway 101. I actually kind of thought it could be 101, could be 102. Yeah. Could yeah. be could be 109. Could I mean, be, I don't know. Will like, you add like some it's change go to it? Like 102.37? I, you know, I thought I'd play with the, <laughs> the, the, the uh, pennies, too. I mean, who knows? Like, that's the beauty of pricing, man. It's it's like, it's people think it's the numbers that do the selling. Like, because Ted Nicholas did the test, like, back in you know, whatever it was, 1605 or whatever before, <laughs> whatever it was. And he's like, sevens and nines are the work. You know, for his books and his offers at that time and all that, I have no doubt it did. In the, in the media, the newspapers, whatever he was running it in. But it's so different now that people aren't really buying the number. They're buying you. If you have, if you're using email and building a relationship with your customer, they're not buying the price. Like I noticed you bought my, uh, Albembo press book. I bought all, I love your books. I love them better yeah. than the newsletter. Well, well, the thing is, is like the price, did it really matter if it was 701 or, you know, 790 or, you know, 697, would it really have made a difference? Probably not. That's not really what people are buying. Yeah. Well, you're asking the wrong guy because I also bought on the first day. I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> you don't need well, to give the me the thing. scarcity or any of that. I'm like, oh, here's here's what I've been waiting for. Thanks. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoy it. Um, I, you know, it's very complex stuff. Like it really is the most complex. I didn't even realize it would be that complex. When I sat down to write, I'm like, holy crap. Like I didn't realize how much I forgot I knew. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like there's all these like layers of stuff. So I hope you enjoy it. Absolutely, dude. I just finished Brand Barbarian and using some of that. So this ah. is the perfect segue then. Oh, I shouldn't have said segue. That's bad bad uh, manners. <laughs> but let's move into the next section. And uh, I'm wondering, Ben, what is the most worthwhile investment you've ever made? Well, I would say the most worthwhile investment is just investing in my own knowledge of, in copywriting and both copywriting and email copywriting specifically. In fact, I could say the two best investments I made financially in business that have generated, if I had to like, I can't even narrow it down to one because they're both kind of work hand in hand. But in two, late 2007, I, I got this uh, copywriting assignment and I think it paid me like $8,500 or something. And I immediately took that 5,000 of that and I bought Gary Bensavanga's farewell DVDs. Like that was his last, hurrah type thing. And I mean, it just changed everything with my sales copy and results I got for clients. And just, I can't like to this day, I'd still thank the guy regularly. I asked him like, if there's a charity or something that I could donate to because it's, and, and he sees me donate to every year and he doesn't, he never asked me to, he was, wow, Ben, you're really generous. I'm like Gary, this is like a drop in the bucket compared to what, like, I'm so grateful to that guy. I really am. And then the other one would be Matt Fury's original email course of theory method for making a fortune with email. I, I just consider that. And like that to me was the email side changed absolutely everything for me. I've told him that, I mean, I tell him all the time, those two courses, in my opinion, I don't even know if you can get the Gary Benson bang one anymore. Or he's last I heard he's getting low on him because he had him he only made 2000 sets. And that's, he said, that would be it. Um, I think Matt's, you can just get out his site at Matt but those two, I'm telling you, those two courses, just absolutely the best investment. They paid more than anything else I can think of 
for my life. And it's, you know, certainly trickled down to everyone that has benefited from, from my successes, clients, students, and everything else. Yeah, man. So Ben, what are bad recommendations you hear in your uh, area of expertise? Bad recommendations, the worst one. For emails, at least, if we're, I'm just going to say emails. I mean, even though I do way more than email now, but let's just stick with email. It's people like talking about and teaching and bragging about and worrying about their open rates. I, I don't know why this doesn't die off, Jonathan. I don't know. You and I have made fun of this stuff for years ourselves. Like, remember, we were, we called, we started calling nurture sequences, nursing sequences. I mean, it, but it, it's, this open rate means nothing. Like, there's not a single computer. I've talked to several computer scientists, people who actually use the scientific method to test and track you know, sales and all that. They all laugh at all these guys who talk about open rate. They just like, they, 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 to them, it's just like so stupid. That they don't even bother like even talking to people about it. They they just let people because it's it's like they're so it's so obvious to them, you know, just at a level that they see things at as people who have actually had the discipline to run actual real scientific exper- experiments where you actually use the scientific method where you try to break down your own processes and try to get it not to work and you try to disprove your own theories and none of them can understand why anybody much less anyone who would call themselves some kind of internet guru <laughs> would even care about open rates. It's, it, I just made fun of this recently as a joke. I said, it's about as relevant. I'll tell you a little story about this. I said, it's about as relevant as your, your Frogger score from the arcade in 1981. That's about how relevant your open rates are. And it's funny because I heard from Brian Kurtz. He emailed me, he replied to that email. Now, Brian Kurtz, if anyone doesn't know who he is, he's like the godfather of direct marketing today. Like he's, you know, he used to basically, he was the vice president of Boardroom Inc., which was like a multi-hundred million dollar direct, mostly direct mail. I mean, the vast majority of direct mail just understands testing, statistics, and lifetime value and metrics that actually matter. And like when you're spending money to run an ad or test ads, you don't get to just go around and just casually do it. It costs money. A whole teams of production are involved. It's a big deal. And so you know, he, if anybody would know this just from a marketing side, it would be him. And he replied back and he said, Ben, can I take these 12 things that you just said in this that are better than open rates to care about 12 markers, far more important than open rates and put them on my blog. And I said, you know, Brian, for you, anything. And I said, go forth and do it. My blessing. <laughs> and so, you know, to me, that was, that was, uh, you know, between that and the computer scientists like Jim Yagi, you know, Jim Yagi, yeah. you know, these guys just laugh at any of this open rate stuff. It's just stupid. All right, Ben, why do results matter? Well, I mean, it's kind of like what, why a score matters, right? On a scoreboard. Like, how do you know if you're winning? <laughs> how do you know if you're progressing? Uh, how do you know if any, why would anybody believe you if you're doing some kind of service that has a results tied to it? Um, if, you're, if someone's going to invest time reading something you've written or something you've recorded, if you don't have any kind of results, why should they listen? You know, so I think I think it's everything. I think without results, it doesn't mean someone should let that stop them, by the way. If we're talking about business here, like, OK, maybe you maybe you don't know. Maybe you're like Dr. Phil. You're just kind of almost like a, a pseudo fraud. You know <laughs> like what you do, but you still give advice. You know, you don't let it stop you. Go out there and, and get the results. You know, I, like I'll just use copywriting as an example. I know this this will apply to a lot of stuff, but there's copywriters like I don't know how to get my first client. I'm like, well, you be your own first client then. Go go out there, build a freaking product, or find a product to sell. Find a list of people who you know who let you joint venture with them. Put up your own sales copy, write your own emails, do all the stuff you know how to do. Do a deal. There's VP, and I don't care if you get one sale, at least that's a result. And you're going to learn stuff and you're going to get a better grasp of your craft. You're going to understand more than just the writing side, like just all this stuff. And that's just talking about copywriters, but you could apply this to anyone in any business. Just You got to get started somehow. If you have something to share with the world to improve people's lives, don't let a lack of results stop you from getting results, if that makes sense. Because that's a big thing, right? Like people are afraid to start. They're afraid to try. Well, no one's going to believe me. Yeah, you know, there's so many ways around that, that that's not an issue once you understand marketing. So don't worry about that. Yeah. I, uh, all right. I, I, I want to get into some, 
some other things and go deeper on that, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. I'm going to stay focused and stay the course. So Ben, in the last five years, what new realization has helped you get better results for your customers, clients, or anybody that's working with you? In the last five years. So we're talking 2015. I think, I don't know if this is the most important thing or the biggest thing, but it's certainly probably the one that I would never have thought would be the thing. Um, and that is really understanding how a brand is built, even though direct marketers like poo poo on branding and all that. And, and, and to a degree that that's justified, you know, but a couple of years or last year, I decided to write a book that you mentioned earlier called Brand Barbarian. And I didn't want to write this book. Nobody asked me to write it. Nobody even ever indicated my entire business existence that, Ben, you should write a book or create a product about branding. Never in, in, has it ever happened. But I kept seeing people just giving such terrible branded bites. And this, and by the way, I say this as someone who has been off social media. So, you know, I don't even know how bad it is on social media. All I can tell you is there's certain people that would forward me stuff talking about branding and they think that you have to have like a filtered iPhone camera and all this stuff. And, you know, everything's a, a talk in the car on the way to brunch, you know, like that's not a, like that's all that is just horse crap. And like, that's what they're teaching out there. I'm like, okay, that's it. I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to write a book about this. And I, I sat down and I, I wrote it extremely fast. I didn't realize how much I actually was doing for my own brand until I sat down and write it. And, I got to say, Jonathan, of all the books I've, I, first of all, it's, it's like the third highest selling book I've written. But besides, besides that, I think it gets the most testimonials of all of them because it's something everybody can control, that everybody can understand. And it's something that if you do it right, it does take time to build a good brand and all that. But you can start like right away by doing some very simple things. And so I would say that is the thing that's changed the most for me is just this realization of just how powerful such a concept like having a powerful brand and then using it and then realizing once you do it right and i just never thought of any of this jonathan so i sat down to write about you don't really have competition after that even if you're not that good at what you do so that's the first thing i'm gonna there's actually a second thing i hope it's okay if i give two answers on this because this is very recent actually this is super recent for me i mentioned that guy vance morris right in service you know, Jonathan, I know that you've listened to Lead the Field by Earl Nightingale, and I've listened to it. And, you know, I've practically memorized Earl Nightingale for the last 20 some years. And yet I always seem, I always seem to like skip the part or not give it as the importance it needed is when he kept talking about service, service, service. I'm starting to realize that service really is everything. It's, it's like anybody can give outstanding service. I don't care if you're brand new. Or if you have money, it's even easier to do because you can start like really wowing people. But service, outstanding service. And I'm telling you, it's embarrassing that it's taken me so long to care about this. But I, th I thought about this. I've been thinking about this a lot, actually. And I got to say, it's, it's like bringing a nuclear bomb to a knife fight. It really is if you do it right. And, you know, some of the best service people out there, if you just study what they do, like, there's a book called 10 Greatest Salespersons. I don't know how easy this is to come by anymore, but the first, it's a bunch of interviews. With, it's interviews with 10 really presumably good salespeople, although nine of them I thought were really boring. But the first one was Joe Girard, who's like, you know, the Guinness Book of World Records, you know, longest holder of greatest salesman in the world before he died. And he was selling 1,200 cars a year, while most car salesmen barely even do like, you know, a fraction of that many sales. He had... I mean, for him selling cars, he was a multimillionaire just as a car salesman, just selling Chevys, quite frankly. It wasn't, it's not like he's selling like, you know, Lamborghinis or something. And this guy, that whole chapter, I'm telling you, his whole secret was just service. Like, I'll give you an example. This guy was amazing. Like, I would love to buy a car. Like, it would have been a pleasure to buy a car from this guy. Like, I would have looked forward to it. I would have looked for reasons to buy a car just if I could have dealt with him. And I know a lot of people felt that way. But for example, you know, you're out, you're in the, like, you're in his office, right? And it's time to talk price and all that. So, you know, he doesn't get the calculator out. He doesn't get out the, any of that stuff. He fucking asks you what, I'm sorry. I hope that's, that's all right if I <laughs> cool. throw that word in there. Um, he asks you, what's your favorite drink? And he's got like every brand of booze in his office. He's got a little bar in his office. 
the guy says, well, th- you know, whatever. So he pours the guy a drink <laughs> and then he pours himself a drink. Although his drink is just watery. So I did want to drink on the job. And he goes, you know, just, just relax, have a drink. You know, don't, you know, like just totally at ease. What car salesman does that? And then like one guy called in, he told the story about how this guy called in who he had sold a car to previously. So this is a customer who already left, right? Like you, most car salesmen is out. That's it. I'm done. I got the money on to the next one. He considered the sale a sacred thing. Like you were his customer for life as far as he, he was going to protect you in any way he could. And so he had this one guy call him and complain about how he was getting really bad service at the dealer. And he goes, it's your fault because you didn't call me. <laughs> he tells the customers, because you didn't talk to me. I told you when I sold you this car, I say, you have any problems. You call me directly on my phone to me and I will take care of it. And he would go, he would go up the chain of command to get a customer's complaint fixed. He's even up to like the chairman of General Motors if he had to. Now you talk about an advocate, right? That's like a service. And you know, there was a whole bunch of stuff he he would do, and you'd come in there, and it was none of it was gimmicky or tricky. You know, this guy would sell you a car, and then he'd go down to the he'd find out you know, he gets the, he finds out all about you when you're there, and he find out where you work. And on a slow day, he'll go through his list of you know people who recently bought cars. He'll go down to the plant where the guy works and just sort of make sure the car's doing good and that you're doing okay. Is there anything I can do for you? Now, what does that do, right? That kind of service, what does it cost him? Like he was already probably out to lunch or whatever anyway. But those little things, people could not help but refer their friends, family, everyone they could think of to him. He had this rule, the 250, he called it. Um, and that means everybody really knows 250 people that they would probably complain to or praise you to when given the chance based on how you service them or not service them. So this is very long winded. But I mean, that to me, and I'm just like, I am. I am ashamed, Jonathan, that I just never really thought or cared much about this. I've always done service. Like I always do, like I always do fast service. I ship fast. I don't cheap out. I do a lot of right thing, but I was just doing it as a matter of of principle. Now I'm consciously thinking about it. Now I'm thinking back when I was a freelance copywriter, how many opportunities I missed. Like, for example, you know, when you're making enough money as a copywriter, let's say you're making, I don't know, eight or nine or $10,000 an assignment. I, I could have, you know, what I would do, Jonathan, if I was, if I was in that position now and I wanted to never have to worry about clients again or anything, I would have invested a thousand dollars of that fee. I would have like flown out to the client during the launch, take the guy out to, you know, to the, you know, to, to eat, maybe play some golf with him, put his mind at ease, say, look, I'm here the entire launch, whatever we got to do, I'm here for you. I would probably call the web guy up, make sure he's doing everything okay, call up everyone that I could call up my own people to double check his funnel. You know, I would just do whatever it took to make that client so happy and so just excited to deal with me. I probably would have found out what his best favorite scotch is or something and brought a bottle of it with us. You know, I would have done stuff like that. I would have made it so that just doing business with me, just hiring me is something that they cannot wait to do again. And that when they go to their masterminds and all of that, I'm the topic of conversation. This guy takes care of you. After, the, after he got, after I get done getting paid, I'd still be checking in. You know, I want to make sure you're okay. Well, you use that stupid, uh, what I call copywriting sex robot copy, which is like the AI generated stuff. Use that stupid AI generated copy for your order form. No, no, no. Let me take a look. Oh, look, let me fix this for you. 30 seconds of my time, probably, Jonathan, to do something like that. I'm not even getting paid for it. Let me help you with this. I would want them to be so successful and I don't want to be a part of it. And I would just consider their business mine. And I think it's just a mindset change. I think it's just an inner game thing is that we stop thinking of this antagonistic relationship with our customers and clients. And like, no, this is a, this person's business is my business. I'll treat it like I own stock in their business. What would I do? And I'm telling you, it changes the whole complexion of the entire relationship. Man, I love it. I think you've always had that anyways, and it comes through in, in your products that you sell, your books. Now it's all books, but I think that comes through that you want people to have better results. So speaking of that, Ben, what area of your business would you like better results? <sighs> I'm at this point where I'm... I just, after about two years or something, I don't know how long it's been, where I've been writing books and converting all my other products into books that the only thing I am, am wait, I'm morally just patience for me at this point, because 
I've got everything dialed in exactly the way I want it. What I don't have is the technological side dialed in. However, in one of my other companies called Learnistic, which is a mobile app company, we're building all the stuff that I want into it. Like that's the beauty of owning this company is because I get to have my dream email platform, my dream shopping cart, all that stuff. It's, I just have to have patience because it's going to take about you know a year, maybe a little longer to get all this stuff in the way we want. So for me, the challenge is more of a patience thing and not so much a sales thing. I've got my time, you know, I've got my time all dialed in. I've got everything I want in place. Everything's there. It's just a matter of waiting for this stuff to get done. And it's going to be incredible, I think. Yeah, I was actually in your app just the other day. I saw your interview with uh, Jimmy Pollard, uh, Financial oh, yeah. Advisor Marketing. Uh, cool. So, Ben, what results are you mo most proud of? <sighs> Man, well... I, th I think I'm just most proud of, of writing. You know, this has nothing to do with business. I think the thing I'm most proud of in a weird way is writing the eight novels I wrote because I don't know anyone who's like personally who's done that. And it's like, a, it's like one of those achievements that I don't know, it's, it's more of a personal thing, but it's, I'm very proud of it. Now these books are not, in my opinion, the greatest books ever written. I do like to think they're entertaining, <laughs> okay? but there's a certain sense of pride with it. In fact, Talking about service, Jonathan, I think this kind of goes with it, is I've been thinking of like ways to, to really to do something with these novels, right? Because I don't really promote them. I don't really. I mean, in fact, I went, I, I'm ashamed to say something else. You and I even did a whole podcast about this like six years ago, my zombie cop marketing plan. And I haven't done a damn thing that I said. That <laughs> thing. And, but I'm like, I, uh, I had this idea to take the Omega edition, which is all seven novels plus a bonus eighth novel I wrote all under one cover. I had some appendix chapters and all this stuff in there. And I said, I want to do some, I want to, I want to sell a $1,000 copy of this. Like, like literally it would cost a thousand dollars to get a signed copy of the book. And I thought, well, how, why would anybody, why the hell would anybody do that? And I said, I'll tell you. And I, and then my brain just answered because I'm in this service minded thing. Now I'm like, well, I would have the delivery at like come in a giant crate with a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, like framed wall art of every cover, probably create some kind of weird mini convention just for the fans, you know, like some kind of like mixer of the four or five or six people who would actually buy this, make it like a really classy thing, you know, and a really classy place. Just make it this experience, you know, just tons of swag, it's not even about me making a thousand dollars, you know, or anything like that. It's about being charging so much money that I can afford to make it this really cool experience, you know, have my own branded, I'm sure this can be done. My own branded, like booze <laughs> branded, you know, with the Enoch war stuff and, you know, blood red wine or something. I don't know. I, I've been actually writing ideas for this down like crazy lately. And that's the thing I'm most, I think I'm most proud of just accomplishing. I'm not most proud of those books necessarily. In fact, some of them I think are a little gruesome, like a little disturbed, even by my own standards. And I'm like, did I write that? You know, it's like, you know but it's just, it's just the, uh, the having done it, it has been a big deal. For me, at least. It doesn't mean anything to anyone else, but to me, it's been a big deal. Yes, sir, man. A lot of people talk about it. Not many people do it. So Ben Settle, bensettle.com. This guy is uh, second to no one in marketing, positioning, branding, email, marketing. I learned it all from him. So to you, brother, I owe all of my success because I wouldn't have had it if I didn't get the results that I got from learning from you. So thank you for that. Anything you want to say as we're wrapping up? No, I'm, uh, you know, I appreciate you having me on. And, uh, I guess if you want to check anything of mine out, just go to bensettle.com. And depending on when you're listening to this, I'm going to have a new, new mobile app up actually that nobody's had access to yet. And I'm going to have like a ton of stuff in there that nobody's ever seen, but that's, that it depends on when you're listening to this, if that's ready or not, but just go to bensettle.com, get a free issue of PDF for the first email players issue. Uh, see if you like that or not, or just enjoy the blog and do whatever you want there. Unsettled.com. I'm going to give a testimonial to that because the only reason I was able to afford your street smart email system was because I downloaded that free PDF, proceeded <laughs> to use it to write emails to my list and made about 1100 bucks that week. And it was the first time I made that much in a week just through email. And that's where you got me started on the journey, brother. So Ben settle dot com is where you go to get more from Ben. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Results leaders for tuning in. And we'll be back next time. Cool, cool.
that is a wrap for another edition of resultsleader.fm. If you are out there getting results for your clients and you want to be featured on the show, go to resultsleader.fm now and apply to be on the show. And if you love what you're hearing, share the show, give us a rating and review, do anything to help us get the message out there. Thought leadership is easy, but results leadership is hard. This is the podcastfactory.com.